We realize that for decades now, these governments have been alleged to have experimented with weather control, but nothing conclusive. This time we're bringing in the laws of physics rather than simply uh, waving our hands and uttering mumbo jumbo. <laughs> we're actually using trillion watt lasers yeah. now. Laser at a power of one watt. And if you don't want to use your energy to strike your match, you can just hold it in the beam of light. A one watt laser can light a match. Imagine then the power of a 500 trillion watt laser. That's exactly what they've built here at the National Ignition Facility in California, where engineers have just finished constructing the laser to end all lasers. In an interview aired by CBS, Dr. Kaku admitted that recent made homemade hurricanes have been the result of government weather modification programs in which the skies were sprayed with nanoparticles and storms then activated through the use of lasers. It says in an interview below, Michio discusses the history of weather modifications before CBS crew stop him in his tracks. The High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, HARP, was created in the early 1990s as part of the Ionospheric Research Program jointly funded by the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. According to government officials, HARP allows the military to modify and weaponize the weather by triggering earthquakes, floods, and hurricanes. They were talking about climate change yesterday, and now we're learning that scientists and researchers are looking at how to change the weather on purpose. That's right. Lasers now could one day manipulate rain and This was uh, from the military news. It's about uh, aircraft laser-borne weaponry, a Boeing YAL-1. And look for the blue flashes, folks. That's what we saw in the skies. Those are the lasers being used, that they're pulsing the electromagnetic fields of plasmic energy uh, that they excite with the winds in order to direct the ready field. See the blue? These are caused by these laser beams. And we'll get into the whole thing about lasers and when they're created here in a little bit. But look at the blue, folks. That's what many, many comments, and I saw it as well, we saw blue sparks or flashes in the sky. And that's what they were, is these little blue beams of laser energy right there. See it? That's what we saw. So this is pr pretty positive that this was a laser-directed, directed energy weapons used on the uh, Northern Cal fires here. Um, well, here's some and before and after photos. Uh, this is in the coffee district here, which we're talking about, that got attacked um, notice they're completely obliterated. Um, and here's the area of the map, the sections where the fires first started. And this uh, evacuator area is a Tuesday afternoon is what we're going to get into here in a minute. All right, so this is uh, Santa Rosa in the area. This is pictures uh, similar to the ones I took the other day in the coffee district area. Again, you can see the ridge fires coming up. Take a look at this, folks. See the stain, a stone block wall? It's all gone, folks. The heat had to be enough to melt the wall. Columns were melted. Wrought iron steel melted. No glass. 2,600 degrees to melt glass. No glass. Look at the stone walls. Imagine how hot the heat had to be just right away. There was no buildup of the fires that happened right away. These things were torched. And let's look at some melting temperatures. Uh, metal, aluminum. 1220 degrees Fahrenheit, 660 degrees Celsius. Uh, wrought iron, 1482 to 1593 Celsius, 2700 to 2900 degrees. Steel, carbon, 2600 around the same wage, 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, what is the um, melting of point of glass? Glass melts at between 2,600 and 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, and you don't see, I didn't see any glass at all in any of the cars, any of the homes. There was no glass at all, completely obliterated. So that means the temperature of the fires immediately, this fire was immediate. There was no firestorm that was created. It happened immediate. was over 2,600 degrees. How about metal uh, tires? We saw the rims, and there's no rubber at all on any of the tires. The rubbers were completely gone. 
Well, here it says in sciencing, if you put a rubber tire in a furnace, even a hot one, it won't melt. The tires are vulcanized, which means they're through a process that combines the rubber molecules with carbon and other elements to prevent them from oxidizing or burning. It's why hot rodders can burn rubber without setting anything on fire. And the fires are said to merge. They're bringing people down, firemen from um, Idaho, Washington, Oregon. They're planning it to merge and continue on. Uh, this is a picture from down the road. There's a Hilton Hotel, or what was the Hilton Hotel, and the Fountain Grove Inn right below it, which was. But look at the steel. Look at the steel melted and twisted, folks. That means the temperatures was above 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It wasn't a firestorm because it happened right away. This was a beautiful barn from 1890s. I'm so sorry this burned down. It was a beautiful round barn. And these counties declared state of emergency. All right, so let's get into Directed Energy Weapons, or DEW. They've had this technology for a very long time, folks. Um, they just don't tell us about it. The beginning of was the Allies and Axis conducted basic research and studies into primitive directed energy weapons before World War II. The Allies and the Axis were partners. British scientists calculated electronic systems of the time could not generate the power necessary for a death ray. That's not true. Nikola Tes Tesla had the death ray already. That's what Tesla technology was developed in 1905 to 1910. During the Cold War, U.S. Soviet Union together studied the possibility of creating particle beam weapons, which fire streams, electrons, protons, neutrons, and even neutral hydrogen atoms. The kinetic energy imparted by a particle beam stream destroys the target by heating the target's atoms to the point that the material literally explodes. Now, if there's aluminum from chemtrails on the ground in the soil and the trees and what, there's your combustion. These weapons were considered for both land and space-based systems. Because beam strength degrades rapidly as particles react with the atoms in the atmosphere, it requires an enormous power plant to generate a weapons-grade beam. How about a trillion watts of power focused, as uh, Michu Kaku was saying on today's show a couple weeks ago. So the theoretical underpinnings was Albert Einstein, 1917, folks. Promising laser devices is the free electron laser uses rings of magnetically confined electrons whirling at the speed of light to produce laser beams that can be tuned up and down the electromagnetic spe spectrum from microwaves to ultraviolet energy. They produce continuous beams or short, intense pulses of light in every spectrum from infrared to ultraviolet. And we all saw blue lights around here. There was blue, as you'll see in the uh, United States Air Force laser test. They have blue circles, and that's what we saw. When a laser beam strikes a tire, tire target, the energy from the photons in the beam heats the target to the point of combustion or melting, and it travels at the speed of light. They're well suited for use against moving targets, blah, blah, blah. Um, the number of shots a laser weapon can produce is only limited by its power supply. Depending on the laser, that means that weapons can have an almost endless magazine of laser bursts. So the electric electro laser is a type of electroshock weapon that is also a directed energy weapon. It uses lasers to form an electric conductive laser-induced plasma channel. A fraction of a second later, a powerful electronic current is sent down this plasma channel and delivered to the target, functioning overall as a large-scale, high-energy, long-distance version of a taser electric shotgun. The current is fed into the plasma channel created by the laser beam. The laser beam rapidly heats and ionizes surrounding gases to form plasma. The plasma forms an electrically conductive plasma channel. So the ether, or aether, the air, is electromagnetism. By exciting the air, exciting the ions, it creates the plasma fields, and then the circulating winds excite the atoms and the molecules to create the conductive atmosphere for the laser to be fired. This is what they did. Because a laser-induced plasma channel relies on ionization, gas must exist between the electro-laser weapon and its target. If a laser beam is intense enough, its EM, EMF field, electromagnetic field, is strong enough to rip electrons off air molecules or whatever gas happens to be in, in between them, creating plasma similar to lightning. The rapid heating also creates a sonic boom, but they don't have to have a sonic boom, but people did hear explosions. So uh, as electrolasers and natural lighting both use plasma channels to conduct electronic current, electrolaser can set up light-induced plasma channels for such. Direct atmospheric 
a lighting to terrestrial collection stations for the purpose of electric power generation. This is what I did a piece on about the uh, lasers being used with solar with panels in the sky down to conductive uh, solar panel fields in the desert for space-based energy. As a weapon to make a thunderhead deliver a precise lightning strike into a target from an aircraft, the aircraft and laser can be compared to a triggered spark gap. In a relatively minor amount of initial output from the laser allows a large amount of energy to flow between the cloud and the ground. Got it? Manufactured, directed energy weapons used for weather war terrorism. It's all right here. All right, so let's blow the skirts over your guys' heads by showing you how this works. This is part of the Agenda 21. I highly recommend a book by Rosa Corey, who lives here in the area of Santa Rosa, wrote a book called Behind the Green Mask about Agenda 21. She chronicled the Santa Rosa area, and look what gets targeted, Santa Rosa, Sonoma, Napa. All right, so here's the areas of evacuation on Monday. This is where the fires first started. Big one in Santa Rosa, Napa, Sonoma. This is when it first broke out. All right, now check this out. Now here's the evacuation area from Santa Rosa. Now notice the streets, Fountain Grove, Shanate, Montecito. Notice where these were evacuations on the initial thrust. Now I want to bring your attention over to this document here. And this is a document that was sent by a lady named Kathleen. It's the City of Santa Rosa Department of Planning and Economic Development, Citywide Summary Pending Development, June 2017. And if you go back and forth between these two, you'll notice these streets are the exact same. Here's Shanate, here's Pacific, Mendocino Avenue, here's Highway 12. Isn't it interesting that the exact areas that they're evacuating are the exact areas that are zoned for Agenda 21 development? You cannot make this stuff up. This is from uh, from Kathleen who wrote, the maps of the fires and the planned are already approved housing projects are identical, nearly identical. I think that our government and developers who put them in office are, are the arrogance and think that no one will notice. If anyone does point this all out, being able to prove it is another issue. Um, now they've taken this site down since she posted it. She did a screensaver, so we have it still. All the insurance companies are set up at the shelters to process claims. Pay everyone off fast, calm them down, and put money towards the new home. When they find out how much additional money it will cost and how long it takes to navigate the building permits process, buying a ready-made brand new home will be an easy will be an easy decision, even if it means a much smaller one on a smaller lot. It kills me when I think of all the people who are homeless and who, if they have the means and termination rebuild, will not be able to have anything like the homes they lost, even if they have unlimited funds, because of the absurd building codes that are being put into place thanks to the UN Agenda 21. Fireplaces won't be allowed. Setback requirements are changed. Building high, high requirements. Green engineering design requirements. And what do you think after these fires are going to do, folks? They're going to add to that. And other arbitrary codes that were deliberately created to make a building a residence needlessly frustrating, time-consuming, and very expensive for developers. How convenient that everyone who just recently lost a home will be, at, be able to buy a ready-made stack-and-pack residence in a nice but much smaller planned development with their insurance money if they get any. There are plenty of even smaller apartment options will be there. What about all the burned down properties? People will be glad to do, do what, get whatever they can if they choose not to rebuild and the developers, banks, and speculators are waiting now with cash in hand. This is happening with FEMA in uh, Houston as well, talking to people. FEMA finally arrived and they set up a loan office. You can borrow up to $200,000 against your molded home. And they, you, you, this is part of the same game. This is Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. Please read up on this, folks. But, but getting back to this document, so here's the evacuation uh, area over here, Santa Rosa evacuation area. Here, here's the identical map of where they want to rezone everything. And if we scroll down, here's all the properties. And you see conditional use, design review major, design review major. And here we go again. Here's the same roads, Piner, Guerneville, West College Avenue. And this is the, evacuate, this is the pending uh, development on the other side of the freeway. Same exact stuff, College, Pacific, Fulton, 
right where they want to redesign everything with design reviews. Oh, how conveniently a middle of the night, out of nowhere fire with 2,000 degrees plus temperature Fahrenheit. Look at this map. This is on the east side. This is Hone Avenue, Yalupa. Again, <laughs> it's just a coincidence, folks. Coincidence theory. This is the area Yalupa down in here, part of the evacuation area. How convenient that the redevelopment area coincides perfectly with the Santa Rosa development plan, Sebastopol Road, Stony Point Road, all in the evacuation sites. You cannot make this stuff up. This was planned, organized well in advance. Geoterrorism, folks. And now we got the movie coming out about the firestorm coming out the same day as Geostorm. Same, and, and the president saying, hey, we're in for a storm, the calm before the storm. They tell us what's happening. It's up to us to wake up and be the change we must see. We have to be the change, folks. This is our time. This is our time to shine, not be afraid, not to cower. You know, get over your grieving, have a pity party, but now it's time to get active. We were born for these times. We're made for these times. We incarnated here to do this work. We're fighting Armin. We're fighting Satan. We're fighting the devil. Whoever you want to call this, this is evil. And it's hitting Houston. It's hitting Florida. It's hitting California. It's hitting Canada. It's hitting the world. And it's coming home to roost to the United States. We're under attack. So please, wake up. And wake your neighbors up. People are willing to listen now. I'm meeting a lot more people willing to listen. All right, that's it for I Got for Plain Truth. I hope you woke up a little bit for this and understand this was a directed energy weapon beam. Thousands of degrees temperature came at 2 in the morning, same type as Hurricane Harvey came at 1.32 in the morning after they drowned it to a tropical storm, so people all stayed. Here there was no notification. We saw blue flashes, which now we can confirm was probably a laser airborne laser device, and uh, that the city of Santa Rosa Department in Planning has planned a summary and pending development design review in the exact same areas where they were evacuated due to the fire, first firestorms that were hit. Looking at a 25 megawatt railgun, able to blow a hole in anyone. <laughs> 25 megawatts of power, just like your local cell phone tower. <laughs> Notice the power supply. Railgun, cell phone tower, railgun, 25 megawatts of power, and your local cell phone tower. The FCC limits cell towers to 400 watts per rectenna, yet the cabling here suggests a 25 megawatt power supply, a 25 megawatt maximum burst effect. To put that into perspective, here's what a 2 kilowatt magnetron can do. A 2 kilowatt microwave on a stick. Now just imagine what a 25 megawatt cell phone tower can do. It can cook you while you sleep. A weapon of last resort to depopulate undesirable locations. It's a weapon of last resort in case of an invasion or an outbreak. If they can GMO the food supply, if they can fluoridate the water supply, if they can spray it like bugs with the chemtrail supply, just imagine what they're authorized to do while you sleep. Chemtrail fallout plus non-ionizing radiation can have disastrous effects. Electromagnetic pollution doesn't have to be at high doses to kill. It can buzz constantly at low doses and still have the desired Agenda 21 effect.